Good morning. I hear, see a few ears were on. Good morning. Happy Sabbath to each one of you. I'm so glad to see a vibrant group together here this morning. We are family, church family, and we like to, uh, to converse and catch up on the week. I know that's always a kind of a highlight of, of seeing one another again. So I hope your week was good, that uh, God uh, that you saw God working in your life each day of the week. And so we're glad that you're here with us worshiping today on the Sabbath day. If you're new to our, our group, I see a couple of visitors or faces that I haven't personally got to meet yet. So welcome here. We uh, want to make sure that you uh, feel a, a active part of this worship service today and that you are blessed. So welcome to our, our group gathering. We have a couple of announcements that we'd like to share with you. Some good things coming up to be aware of. And uh, I won't highlight all of the announcements in the bulletin. I hope you got a bulletin today. There's quite a few in there. I'm gonna let you look, look them over. If you're joining us online, I just wanna remind you that our bulletin is posted on our website, lincolnnorthside.org. And so you can go and find all these announcements there on our website. Um, so the first couple of announcements there, uh, just to, as a reminder, we, we, we uh, mentioned this last week, but the Dyer family and the Nicholson family are, are still grieving the loss of their dear uh, family members. And so information there in the bulletin is uh, posted to how you can bless these two families and show that uh, we care and support them. Uh, those are the first two announcements in, on the uh, the second page of the announcements. Also, there's some, uh, who, like, who enjoys a good fellowship meal? Oh yeah, there's some hands. Well, there's some information that we wanna be aware of for April here, and today is April F Fool's Day, the world calls it, right? But we just like to call it April 1st because this is a special day that God has given us to rest and to worship. But for the month of April, we have uh, scheduled potluck on April, a uh, fellowship meal on April 15th. And that's in conjunction with the discipleship training part two that is being um, presented by Dr. Melvin and Juliet Santos. And if you were here on the first one, you uh, will know that that was a, a really high Sabbath for us, learning about discipleship and, and how we can implement uh, discipleship making into our, our lives. This next part I hear is going to be very practical, very um, teaching us how to apply discipleship even more. And if you didn't get one of these bulletin inserts, uh, there's some still on the foyer, out in the foyer on the little table, I believe. It gives all the details that you need to know, but that's April 15th, and we're looking forward to that. So plan to join us at 930. We're going to uh, um, have a training session at 930 instead of our usual Bible study time that's held at that time. And then also during the worship service, there will be another session, and then there will be an afternoon session at 2 p.m. as well. All right, that's April 15th. On April 22, there will be a another fellowship meal opportunity. And we're looking forward to a opportunity to um, have a ministry fair. And so this is a, always an exciting time of year. If you are new to our church family and have not been um, put to work, so to say, or, or find, found an opportunity to serve, this ministry fair will be a great um, thing for you to uh, enjoy. Uh, there, all the ministry leaders will have information f about their ministry and how you can be involved and join in serving the Lord and uh, sharing Jesus in our community, um, both in our church family here and beyond these walls. So look forward to April 22 with a fellowship meal and a ministry fair. If you have any questions about that, ask Ernest Smith. He's kind of coordinating and and putting, um, organizing this together. All right, Diane, I'd like to invite you up and tell us about an upcoming event that we're, I'm pretty excited about. I'm excited about it. Um, just good morning. I just wanted to put it on here because I've been to get in the bulletin, but on May 8th, there's going to be a Sabbath evening for
Thank you, Diane. Also tomorrow, something is starting. Does anybody know what's starting tomorrow? Follow the lamb. Yeah, there's, there's a few people tuned in. I love it. All right, that's starting tomorrow, Sunday, April uh, 2, and it goes all the way through to Sunday, April 9, right? And there will be a, a, a little short program each day. Pastor, do you want to share any more details? Will you share it with us a little bit later? All right. I just want to highlight the start time tomorrow, 6.30 p.m., all right? So make note of that in your calendars. And uh, finally, last announcement, we like to share good things together, good, good news and information. Uh, we're proud to say that um, David and Jessica Ray had a baby girl this week, Hannah, or Abigail Hannah, Haniah Grace Ray. So we want to celebrate with them. If you, um, if you know the Rays and, and uh, want to celebrate with them, you can provide a bit of a meal for them. That will help them as they get used to uh, their expanded family this week. And information on the meal train is listed in the bulletin there. I think that's all I want to highlight for today. Um, I'd like to direct our attention to our call to worship. So I invite you to stand with me. I have a question before we read this. Why did you come today? Was it for fellowship? Was it for entertainment? Do you come for food after church sometimes? Those are good things, but what is the best thing that we can do in coming to church today? I want to propose that that is worship our Lord. Paul talks about that in Romans 11 and 12. He says, starting in verse 33, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. Amen. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways. His ways are past finding out. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has become his counselor? Or who has first given to him that God should repay him? For of God and through God and to God are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. Therefore, brothers and sisters, I beseech you by the mercies of God that you present yourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God which is our reasonable service. Let us pray. O oh Lord, our God, your love is better than life itself. We gather in your presence today thanking you for this great invitation. What is mankind that you should take note of us? We ask that as we worship today that you will lift us to the hope that is in you. Lift us away from the things that would otherwise seek to chain our hearts to discouragement or hopelessness. And may we find that in you is indeed rest and everything that we could ever long for. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Just a short message came to my mind as we start to sing this song. Jesus said, or God said, he said, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways. And so as we sing this song, let's think of God and his wisdom that he has for all of us.
now time for the children's story and uh, we always look forward to that um, the offering that the children collect helps us provide Christian education for these little ones it's important not only to learn math and science and reading and all those things but to learn of the love of God so this is our what our offering is for today and uh, please remember all the aisles children thank you Yes, these are pancakes, uh-huh. And so Hamisi's mother would bake pancakes, and Hamisi would take them to the market for people who didn't have a lunch with them. 
So one day, Hamisi went to the market like usual, and he was selling his pancakes. And when people would give him money, he would put it in the dish with his pancakes. Well, this particular day, there were some dogs over on the side of the road that were fighting. And he, quick, put down his dish on the rock. We'll see if my rock will cooperate. Oh, my, di my rock will not. We'll put it on the side. My rock is not as flat as Hamisi's was. So he put his dish on the rock, and he went over to look at the dogs. And now there had been some boys standing by his rock. And when he came back, he looked, but his pancakes were gone. And the money that was in the dish was gone. So Hamisi turned to the boys. Who took my money and my pancakes? He said, you took it. We did not take it, said the boys. The rock took it. He, the rock did not take my pancakes. Yes, it did, they said. And on they argued. Well, a man heard them arguing and came over to see what was going on. What happened, he said. The boys ate my pancakes and they took my money, said Hamisi. I know they did. We did not, said the boys. The rock took the pancakes. The man said, well, I don't know how to settle this. He said, they got the rock. We're going to take the rock to the magistrate. That's the one who decides what is right and what is wrong. So up the boys took their big rock and they carried the rock all the way over to the magistrate. The magistrate said, what is the meaning of this? Why do you have this big rock with you? Well, said Hamisi, these boys took my pancake and my money when I was watching the dogs. But they say that the rock took it. The magistrate turned to the rock. He said, rock, did you take the money? Did you eat the pancakes? What do you think? Did the rock answer? No. No. Well, the magistrate said to the boys, did you take the money and the pancakes? No, they said. So the magistrate thought very hard and said, I know how I will settle it. So he brought a basin of water up to the front. And he told the boys, I want you to reach into your pocket when you find any money you have in it. And when you find that money, I want you to drop it in the bowl. And if you don't have any money, you can dip your fingers in the bowl. So one by one, the boys went down. First boy, nope, you are not guilty, said the magistrate. Then came the second, and the third, and the fourth, and the fifth. But then came the last little boy, and he took his money, and he put it in the bowl. So let's see if you can see how the magistrate knew he was guilty. I want you to kind of see what the reward is. Can you see some bubbles there? Yeah, bubbles on the ground. Now, some of you who are in school may know this, but what do you usually put on pancakes in the morning? Yeah. Syrup is a good one, but what do you put in the pan so they don't stick? Do you know? Can you help them on the other pancakes? Oil. Yeah, oil. You know, there's something about oil and water that is true. Oil and water do not mix. Those little bubbles are oil spots because the oil is not mixing with the water. So the last little boy who had dipped his hand into Hamisi's oily pancake and took the money, he had oil on his hand. And so the magistrate told the boy, I'm going to confess, I know it was you. And the boy hung his head and he said, I'm sorry, I took the money. But you know that little boy had a consequence for not obeying what God taught him this rule. Because he took the money, he had to go spend some time in a place where you learn not to break the rule or face go to jail. We don't do that anymore. If a little boy and girls like you, but where he lived, that was a very bad thing, wasn't it? Pancakes, and then he lied about it? Yes. Sometimes when we do things that are not right, we try to hide it. But you know something the Bible says? That not only does God know it, but often that your sins, the bad things you do, they find you out. So if you do something wrong, what should we do? We should ask our mommy and daddy and whoever we hurt for forgiveness so that we won't end up like that little boy and we will make good choices. So uh, whenever you eat your pancakes, I want you to remember this story. Now, this is from an old, old book, and I looked in our library. Did you know we have a library here that you can get books from and read stories like this? We don't have this one, but there are a lot that I read as a little girl that I think you would like. So thank you so much for listening to my story. You guys may all go back to your seats.
Courtney for that beautiful story. Happy Sabbath, everyone. It is exciting to see the energy and life at the front. I don't know about you, but that's one of the more exciting parts of the worship gathering to me. And uh, that speaks of a number of things, one of which is there are a lot of families here in this church. And part of our mission here at Northside in making and mobilizing disciples is dealing with families and the health of our family. So I was so excited to be approached by our family life leaders here at this church uh, who want to engage in part of this mission-focused segment of our church. And so once a month you will hear uh, not just the other arm of evangelism that I usually uh, bring to you, but we will have a time for a family focus as well. Um, and so at this time I'd like to invite forward Mike and Diane Teal. Okay, the pastor took part of my introduction. <laughs> Sorry. So, to make and mobilize disciples who will declare and display the beauty of God's character in his glorious and his glorious gospel in light of his soon return is the mission of our church. And the vision, it says, I looked that up on the website because I don't have it memorized like the pastor does. <laughs> to pursue at all costs a passionate, God-centered life. And so evangelism begins in the home with us. That's where it starts. So all, all of our, we, we want to bring you a little morsel. And all of our little morsels will not be about marriage, but this one's about marriage. Um, there are four things that happy marriages have in common. Number one. When they get up in the morning and they greet each other. Now, when I get up in the morning, I get up about two hours, two and a half hours before my dear bride does. Don't wake me up. So I don't greet her when I get up. <laughs> I greet her before I leave for work. <clears throat> but uh, one of the things that they have in common is when they greet each other in the morning, they share an I love you and a kiss. Shall we demonstrate? <laughs> now, you know, we, we worked at Watchtaw Hills Academy, and <clears throat> we, we had been talked to about our public display of affection <laughs> when we were there. We thought it was good for the kids to see. Yeah, that. well, it didn't change. We, we, were, we were not good students because we didn't learn. So, but number two. Number two. So anytime you're going to separate for the day, husband goes to work, wife goes to work or whatever, then you do the same. You say, I love you, and you give a kiss. And we do that one often. I usually attack him like in the middle of the day too, so it doesn't have to just be that no, time. You, but <laughs> you're getting ahead of, you're getting ahead of, the, game. Ahead of the game. So when you part for the day, he never leaves before telling me I love you and, and giving me a kiss. I never, I never ever have to know that he's gone and I haven't known it because he always comes and gets me. Except for one time. And that was terrible. One I was time shocked. in our entire He left. I can't even believe it. Yep. I only went a mile away <laughs> and I came back. But but that's not part of the four things, okay? So in the morning I greet we have prayer. I greet my wife. I say I love you. I give her a kiss. And, I, and then I kiss her again. I don't always say I love you again, but I say I'm going to work now. So, but. <laughs> Number three, <clears throat> when they return at the end of the day, they greet each other with an I love you and a kiss. This one I saw modeled in my home. I didn't see my parents when they woke up. I didn't see him when my dad left because he left before I got up to go to school. But I did see him when he came home. And when he came home, he would pretty much go straight to my mom and give her a kiss. I'm pretty sure he said, I love you, but I didn't pay attention. <laughs> but, uh, and even though your children, if you have children, may squirm and fuss about it, they still love it. <laughs> What's number four, my dear? Number four is obviously when it's time to go to bed. You're going to 
greet each other again and give the kiss and the I love you. And this may seem like a really small thing, but it's not. Just like I said, when he, that one time he didn't do it, it was just a shock to me. But it's that abiding together like we want to abide with Christ. It's being in tune with each other and letting each other know how much you care. So I challenge, if you've been doing this, do it keep more. it up. If you haven't been doing this, it might feel a little awkward when you start, but I encourage you to start. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, one of my takeaways is I want to encourage all of you at the end of the service today, go to Janae and ask her, did you squirm as a kid? <laughs> She's over there. Just go that way. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I want to share something with you that uh, is exciting in our church life. And just as a statement of gratitude, to you and to hopefully excite you as well on the mission that we have uh, here at Northside. Uh, a couple Sabbaths ago, we engaged in a little bit of an activity together, and we've got a few pictures that I'll just show on the screen, and we'll just go through them uh, at, your, at your pace back there. And, you know, so we, we uh, came together and put some food together, not only eating, but putting food together that we could then distribute um, uh, or help a center of distribution um, for people who needed those resources. Lots of hands, lots of good fellowship. All of this took place, say, just a couple Sabbaths ago, and I believe that we eventually packaged over 100 brown bags uh, that were delivered to this center of distribution here in our local area. There you see several of the bags right there. So I wanted to say thanks to this church family uh, we don't overlook or take lightly the opportunities that we have to make a positive difference in our community. And then perhaps a bigger thank you goes to Nancy Morris, uh, who spearheaded this idea. Uh, she and I spoke several weeks ago about the possibility of looking into some opportunities like this and uh, was willing to jump forward and give direction to what in my mind would have been scary chaos, man, just a lot of things to organize and put together, but Nancy knew what she was doing. Thank you so much for leading out in that effort. Thank you to everyone who was a part of it. And to those who were not, I know you're excited and you're like, man, I missed out. I've got good news for you. <laughs> uh, we want to keep doing this as a church. We, we want to keep um, reaching out and making a difference in this way. So um, we are still in touch. Nancy has talked with me a little bit about possibilities of looking into uh, ways to keep this going. Uh, the frequency is yet to be determined, but you will hear again from the front very soon about our next opportunity, and we're learning each time we do it, uh, things that will make a difference uh, in our efficiency as a church and in making a difference in this way. Finally, before I sit down, uh, underscoring what Elder Terrell has already shared with you, tomorrow we start our series, Follow the Lamb. Oh, a lot of hard work has already gone into preparing the space for that, uh, I don't want to get into too much trouble, but Dennis and Cheryl Kaiser have been very instrumental with it. Becky Gustafson and Gary Gustafson. Man, you know, you should go see the BLC before you leave today. They've really put a lot of time and effort and energy into organizing this. I know that Mark Taggy was also a part of getting those initial um, woodworking and framing. Dale came in all the way from Seward with the lumber to make sure we had what we needed to get going. And uh, yes, several other people helped as well. Uh, please don't crucify me for not calling all the names. I, I don't, I'm not overlooking anyone intentionally, but I did see several of you coming in to help to put that together. And then the rest of you, man, I, I know we're going to fill the house tomorrow night, right? Hey, there it is. Amen. So 6.30. 6.30 tomorrow evening, we start, and we're going to run 6.30 most evenings. So here's how it's going to work. We're following the Lamb, following Jesus, from the moment he enters Jerusalem, through that final week, up to the crucifixion and the resurrection. The Gospels leave most of their room for just that, that final week. They talk most about that. So we're going to talk about that each night. It's not just going to be presentations from the front of the room. Those will happen, 
but we will also have opportunities around each table for takeaways and conversation that will further the themes and further implant them in our hearts. So I want you not just to be there to listen, but to be there to engage, to think about this, to share around your tables, and to come away with perhaps bigger light bulb moments than could happen from the front. Uh, so we, we look forward to that. Um, several local speakers will be involved. Um, I'll start us off tomorrow night, and then that's it for me. It's going to be several local speakers from there each night leading out in the various themes. Thursday night, Thursday night, we're going to have an agape feast that starts a little bit earlier. So plan on 5.30 for Thursday. Uh, we'll start with the agape feast there, and then 6.30 on, we'll continue with the look at what happened that Thursday, the the, the, um, the, the fellowship and the Last Supper and the foot washing, which we will do, communion. By the way, that night's going to be exciting. We're going to have several students from Union College who are currently in a Greek class, and their teacher offered to have them come here and reenact in Greek that Last Supper, just for 10 minutes. So, so we'll be excited to see their reenactment there, and uh, we'll have the English words on the screen so we can follow along as they share in that moment. Um, and then Friday night, Saturday night, 6.30 each, and then Sunday, the last Sunday, no 6.30 meetings. The last Sunday is in the morning. A couple of opportunities for us. Uh, at 7 in the morning, a few of us, or maybe all of you, if you want to, Join me at Holmes Lake at 7 in the morning. Join me at Holmes Lake. We're going to pray and sing out there and just remember what happened early that Sunday morning. Right? I know that our church is filled with young families, so that's not going to be our only gathering. don't know how many kids are going to be excited about getting up and being at a 7 o'clock program. But we'll come back to the BLC, have breakfast together at 8.30. 8.30 breakfast, and then 10 a.m., a special program to culminate the week together. So we look forward to you being a part of as much of that as you can. And then Pastor Hasiel and I have been trying to bat through some ideas about how do we just cap this thing off? And he came to discover, have, how many of you have heard of Sight and Sound? Um, it, it's a, if you haven't heard about it, it's a great uh, place. We've got a couple of campuses, one in Pennsylvania, one in Branson, Missouri, and they do musicals and live plays. Aren't they awesome? Yeah, so... Um, they are having a free live stream of the musical and play for Jesus. And so if you are not tired of hanging out with us all week, after the 10 o'clock program at noon, whoever wants to stay, will just show on the screen the live stream of Jesus. Just the whole thing, and you can stick around with us. We'll probably order in some boxes of pizza or something, so uh, you can hang out with us there. So we're looking forward to all of you not only being there, not only engaging with this program, but inviting someone else to be a part of this as well. Uh, it's just, it's a look at Jesus. He's the center of our focus, and I don't believe there is any evangelism we can do that is better than focusing on Jesus and his finished work on our behalf. So we invite you to that. It begins tomorrow evening at what time? 6.30. I hope to see you all there. Let's continue worshiping together. God bless you. Worshiping in prayer, and I invite you to kneel with me if you're able to. Heavenly Father, we pause now to share with you our hearts through prayer, Lord. And you have asked us to come into your courts with rejoicing and, and praising, Lord. And Lord, you have given us so much to praise you about. We look at you and you're majestic and holy and beautiful. And you've drawn us to yourself, Lord, through your character, through the, the ministry and the, the sacrifice of Jesus. And Lord, we praise you for that. And we thank you for the saving grace that you have freely offered each one of us. And Heavenly Father, sometimes we come to you and our hearts are down and, and we, we, only have, um, we only have a little to give. And that's, that's our heart. And you take our, our sorrowful heart, Lord, and, and bring joy into it. And we're grateful for that as well. So Lord, each of us 
this morning comes from a slightly different place, but we all come to the same God who is loving, who, who cares for us, Lord. You show us that by uh, working through other people and, and bringing comfort through other people and bringing joy through other people, and, and you bring us all together. And that is one thing that is so beautiful to me, is how you always provide what we need when we need it, and we see that you are at work in our lives today. Heavenly Father, as we worship you, help us to uh, um, leave the world behind and to get caught up in the rapturous joy of who you are and how you care for us and how you show us day by day in each moment that you are trustworthy and true to your word. Lord, that we can claim your promise that you will never leave us, but show us step by step by lighting our way the path in which we are to take. So, Lord, thank you for fulfilling your promises in our life and giving us a joy fresh and new each morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, we love you. We worship and Glorify thy name in all the earth. Glorify thy name. Glorify thy name. Glorify thy name in all the Our offering this morning is for church expense. As most of you probably know, a lot of our church expense goes to our physical plant. We heat it, we cool it, we keep fixing it. Uh, but that's not the only thing that's involved. There are ministries in the church. Each ministry receives its uh, funding from our offerings. There are programs we do. Uh, there's Sabbath school for children. We do all of these things through our church offering. One of the things we're doing as a program and outreach, which has been mentioned, is follow the lamb. Even that depends on church offerings for the needs that we have had and will have. By the way, this is a great opportunity to invite somebody to come. You're not inviting them to the church necessarily. They're inviting them to the Better Living Center. Um, I'm going to tell you two past life experiences. People have a misunderstanding a lot of times about who Seventh-day Adventists are. I knocked on a door one time and introduced myself and uh, as a Seventh-day Adventist, and the lady says, oh, I've just been reading about you cults. <laughs> and I said, oh, are we a cult? And she says, well, yes, because you base your salvation on keeping Saturday. And I said, no, we base our salvation on Jesus Christ. And she says, well, you're the first one I've ever heard say that. And more recently, I was standing in the office of our real estate company in Bismarck, and a good friend of mine and the office manager, the three of us were together, and something came up about church and Jesus, and I said something, I don't remember what. And my friend says, well, I thought Seventh Adams just don't believe in Jesus. I said, oh, no. Um, and she, actually, the office manager corrected him before I could <laughs> because she had been to church to visit it and so on. So here's a great opportunity. Invite somebody to see Jesus with you. So would the deacons please stand? Loving Father, I want to thank you today for your love and kindness, direction, and watch care over us. And Father, as we give of our means to supply the funds necessary for our programs and our outreach, our church experience, our fellowship, I just pray that you would bless the offerings that bless each individual giver and giving, and may we all look forward to your soon return. 
In Jesus' name, amen. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Feliz Sábado. I invite you to open your Bible so we can read our scripture reading together. And I'm going to be reading from Proverbs 18, verse 17 to 21. The first one to plead his cause seems right until his neighbor comes and examines him. Casting lots cause contentions to cease and keeps the mighty apart. A brother offended is harder to win than a strong city, and contentions are like the bars of a castle. A man's stomach shall be satisfied from the fruit of his mouth. From the produce of his lips he shall be filled. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Thank you to everyone who has participated this morning in helping to lead our service forward. Uh, Dennis, Maida, Terrell, uh, Pam. Who sang today? Paul. Thank you. And Joel and Rebecca. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Yes, that's right. Rebecca is over here on the organ. Thank you so much to all of you. Courtney, thank you for the children's story. Um, I should say a couple more things before we get into the word today um, about our program coming up. Uh, number one, my wife has been putting a lot of time into preparing something special for the children as well. I didn't mention that during that uh, promotion earlier on. So, yep, the little kiddos are accounted for as well. We invite all families of all ages to be here. And then there is something special, you know, one of the things that excites me is when you share an idea and share a vision and someone just takes it and runs and just does creative things beyond the scope of what uh, was initially planned for. And uh, Becky, in her artistic experience and expertise, uh, is preparing a couple of special stations over there in the BLC that can be for individual value. Uh, if you are wanting to spend some time in silent meditation in God's word, maybe even writing out a confession or something that's between you and God you're working through and you would like God to take that from you, man. She's got a very creative station there. You can write it on a special paper she has. You put that in the bucket of water and watch it dissolve and disappear. 
end in another section where uh, you can just sit and read and meditate on the promises of God related to that final week of his earthly ministry. So uh, just another c- couple of things to look forward to as we plan on this coming week. Before I pray with you, I'd like to begin with a reading of James chapter 3. I'm going to read the whole thing. James chapter 3. This morning I read for you from the New International Version. You're welcome to follow along in any preferred versions that are before you. Here it is. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy, and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. Let's pray. Lord, all that we have, all that we are, All that we hope to be, we give to you. We ask that you will take us in this moment and shape us according to your likeness. Continue the work that you have started in each heart. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As part of my sermon preparation time, every now and again I like to peruse um, contemporary research that surveys the general religious landscape in our wider community today on a wide variety of topics. So I was reading recently 
um, one such research article and kind of one thing just kind of led to the next. You click along and you move through the articles and it kind of shows you another one. And I eventually came across one that was written three years ago in which an assistant professor of religion down in Texas was interviewed. Uh, her name is Robin Globus Veldman. Now, the, the article focused on a particular societal issue and the trend of evangelical response to it. Now, disclaimer, the issue isn't the point of the sermon today, but Professor Robin does make a point in one of her answers recorded in that article that I would like for us to reflect on a little bit as we steer toward our theme for today. She presents her conclusion about the evangelical trend of societal response of course, within the framework that you and I are familiar with of living in the last days. So there's a trend of evangelical response that she, she draws a conclusion from and she pursues what she believes is behind the trend and the nature of response. She borrows a term to describe her conclusion. She refers to what she calls, and here's the borrowed term, the embattled mentality. The embattled mentality. Here's what she had to say, and this is the part that I'd like us to focus on as we look at our theme today. It's a quote from, the, from her response in that article. The embattled mentality refers to a mindset that is traceable to the 1960s. This is her words. And to the perception among evangelicals that they were being increasingly excluded from the public square. It was associated with the complex of societal changes that evangelicals believed to be moving American culture away from its historically Christian orientation. She gives some examples in there. For example, the Supreme Court decisions to remove prayer and the Bible from public schools and others. But again, we're not getting into those weeds today. But again, she continues to say, the embattled mentality has been building for decades within the evangelical community. The embattled mentality. Something born out of a perception of exclusion. And from my experience, as I think about this concept, it's not just something imposed from the outside. I believe churches and Christian religious settings live with and struggle in the place of dealing with embattlement imposed from the inside too. The older generation that feels left behind the younger generation that feels left out, the conservatives, however you define that, uh, who feel as though they are somewhat being outnumbered, the liberals, however you define that, who somehow feel like they are being outcast, I'm talking now about the inside camps of religion that have little room for shared space. And so this concept of an embattled mentality resonates whether we're talking about trends in our society imposing it on the church or trends within the church in which we impose this on one another. Whatever the perception, there is a common mental posture of embattlement that so often ungirds the decisions made and the responses given in the name of religion. It's part of how we often feel forced to live. So we gather with the simmering guidance that we are not them. We gather to build something godly for ourselves. And the strength with which we drive these stakes deeper and deeper 
is derived from what we are opposed to. It's the tragic feeling of exclusion, externally imposed or internally imposed. And the natural response of aversion, <laughs> and ironically, before we know it, the excluded become the exclusive. As we continue our series through the New Testament letter of James, we're getting further into it, but I don't want you to forget how he begins this. I don't want you to forget how he describes in the beginning of the letter who he is writing to. Here it is again. Here's the context. Don't forget the context. Very first wor wor uh, words in this letter. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations, to the 12 tribes dispersed abroad. Now, dispersed abroad in this context is not about mission, right? Go ye therefore. No. Dispersed abroad in James's context has everything to do with persecution. Dispersed abroad has everything to do with exclusion, being cast aside by society at large, out of our comfort zones, away from the way things used to be. Or as James put it, encountering trials of every kind. Yeah, I think the embattled mentality can be traced back way further than the 1960s. <laughs> James is writing to Christians in the first century A.D. And James is writing into this context, I believe, of an embattled mentality, an embattled mentality, and he wants us to be in touch not just with what's happening around us, but what is happening within us as a result of all of that. I agree with the professor. This embattled mentality is building over time. And even though it is usually based on something frustratingly real, the question I want to ask us today is, is it leading us where we really want to go? This embattled mentality, is it leading us where we really want to go? We ought to be reading James today with a fresh perspective, by the way. <laughs> we have our own recent case study over two years, we all went through it. A case study, unearthing the effects and outgrowth of an embattled mentality. This COVID-19 pandemic quickly pushed us all out of our comfort zones and out of whatever we refer to as normal. Ah, 12 tribes out in the dispersion. And it brought up some very serious questions. Of course, one of the biggest ones forming the backdrop of the religious discourse that I heard, and that question is, what really is church? And on the two sides of that came two primary questions. We asked, <laughs> what does loving my neighbor really look like in this season? And different people had different opinions about that. And we also asked on the other side, what does standing up for my religious rights really look like in this season? And we had different people with different opinions on that. One thing was clear. Everyone seemed to have a lot to say. Most of us we're convinced that we were right. Most of us wouldn't mind having the final shaping word. Uh, many stood ready to slander anyone who dared to differ. Uh, we knew, and this part is the part that's most tragic to me, we knew everything we needed to know about someone simply by recognizing whether they were wearing a mask or not and how we ought to treat them. So that the virus itself, and I hope we're far enough removed now that it's no longer that triggering, but the virus itself came into stiff competition 
with the vitriol that arose in its wake. I believe we now live on the other side of the pandemic further embattled. Further embattled. So I'm asking the question, does this mentality lead us where we really want to go? How does a Christian live in times of dispersion? What makes a Christian stand out and remain unstained from the world, especially in hard times? You're hearing some of it in what I'm saying, right? From the perspective of religious liberty, there is an anticipation that things will get worse. So this is an important question for us. We're not over it. Oh, thank goodness the pandemic. But from a standpoint of religious liberty, things are anticipated to get worse, but somehow the Bible suggests that at the same time for the inner workings of the Christian life, things ought to also be getting better. And that's what James is after here in chapter 3. And by the way, we're looking at chapter 3 here, and there's a commentator, K.A. Richardson, who says that this part is not just physically the center of James, but Richardson makes a very bold statement. I had to write this one down. Richardson says it's not only the physical thing, but it offers, here's a quote, one of the most noteworthy bits of advice for the church in the entire New Testament, chapter 3 of James. So if Richardson is right, <laughs> you and I ought to print and pin this chapter on our refrigerators. James chapter 3, some of the most important and noteworthy advice for the church in the entire New Testament. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. He is writing in a context, remember the backdrop of this, chapter 1? Be slow to speak. Be quick to hear. He is talking to people who would much rather teach. He is talking to people who sound like the people Jesus was talking to in Matthew chapter 23 when Jesus said, hey, these Pharisees and religious leaders love to parade through the streets and be called rabbi, be called teacher. We have the truth. We have the material to teach you. We have the authority on Scripture. We have the final word. And Jesus condemned the idea. James now is saying something similar. And James is saying, don't be so quick to run after the status of teacher. Don't be so quick to have such a firm grip on what we have as a copyright on truth and authority. Not so many of you should want to be in that role. Hey, those who teach are going to be judged more strictly. Going to be judged more strictly. Let's talk about common ground. I don't know who we're talking to here. Whatever the camps are, we talked about some of them earlier. Conservatives, liberals. Older generation, younger generation, whoever has everything to say and wants to teach everybody else. Wait, wait. James says there's something we have in common. We all stumble in many ways. We all stumble in many ways. And then before you open your mouth to teach, hear me, says James, anybody who is able to, to be without fault in what they say. Oh, that's the perfect person right there. Do we have anybody visiting Northside today in that category? I'd love to meet you and talk. Never at fault in anything we've said. Never at fault. I said, man, such a person is, is perfect, is blameless, is able to keep their whole body in check. 
Let me jump down past this section here because we're going to come back to it and revisit something that just occurred to me recently in this section. I'd like to share it with you. Maybe it's something that's old news for you. But let's jump down a little while and look at this cognitive dissonance that comes with the embattled mentality in James's day. He says, somehow, this tongue is restless. This tongue is deceptive. This tongue helps us to feel satisfied with our moment of praise over here, never mind the moment of cursing over there. It makes us to feel content with what we have to say when we are in the gathering about God, but not so much attention to what is said about our neighbor. We're all right with the slander. We're all right with the judgmental conversation. We're all right with the criticism. We're all right being better than the rest because, again, loving God is better and more important than loving each other. James already dealt with that. James already dealt with that, and Paul did too in the Galatian letter. He said, you fulfill the entire law in this one statement, love your neighbor as yourself. James, fulfill the whole royal law according to the scripture. Love your neighbor as yourself. He doesn't separate them, but somehow, and like Courtney's children's story today with oil and water, we force two things that are separate into one experience where the same tongue is loving God and hating neighbor. The same tongue is blessing the Most High and cursing the person right next to me. He says, man, this ought not be. How is this so? Why? Why is this so? That's what we're digging to on earth a little bit today. Why is this so? Why is this so? We're going to peek over into chapter 4 a little bit even as we're going today because he is going into more specifics in chapter 4 of the general idea of the restlessness of the tongue in chapter 3. Chapter 4, look at this, for example, in verse 11. Brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. That's the restless tongue. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping the law. You are sitting in judgment on the law. Here are they who keep the commandments of Jesus, the commandments of God, and James says, wait a second, no, you're not keeping it if you're judging other people. You're standing in judgment of it. You're standing in judgment of it. So there is a wisdom, a wisdom that is to navigate how we should live in these end times and how we should wrestle against this embattled mentality that is so tempting to live from. There is a wisdom that is shown by a good life chapter 3, by deeds done in humility, deeds that come from a certain kind of wisdom. But he says, hey, hey, embattled mentality, if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, don't boast about it. Don't deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven. Chapter 1, let's go back to it because the whole thing is connected. Every good and perfect gift comes from God, comes down from heaven you will understand the thing that is guiding you when you see in your life, in your deeds, in your humility, and in the control of the tongue, whether the good gift is from heaven that is being demonstrated. Let me share a quote with you that I found some time ago. This is from Dr. Adrian Rogers. The sign that you are spirit-filled is not the ability to speak in a tongue you have never learned. Most Adventists will quickly say, Amen! Yeah, yeah, we don't believe that. There's a certain take on the gift of tongues, right? So, not the ability to speak in a tongue you have never learned, but the ability to control the tongue you do have. 
Oh, wait, we got silent on that one, right? Yeah. The first part is a big amen from me. Because, yeah, we, there, there, there's huge misunderstandings about the gift of tongues. But is there a huge misunderstanding about the value of controlling the tongue? The control of the tongue. So let me look with you at what uh, just recently stood out to me in chapter 3. And hopefully land in a reasonable place with you today. Chapter 3 has a big subject coming from a little object. Right? A big subject coming from a little object. The big subject is how uncontrollable this thing is. And the little object is the tongue. And then James gives some examples. And I believe that the examples he gives are very insightful because they dig deeper. They dig deeper than the tongue. Watch this with me. The first example, when you put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey who? Obey us. We can turn the whole animal. Stay with me on it. This is my favorite example now. This is one I'm going to stay with the, the longest. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, yet they are steered how? Are you reading with me? By a what? By a very small rudder. Okay? So what's the rudder symbolizing here metaphorically? The tongue. And that's again the big deal here in this chapter. But James always pushes just a little bit further than that with his examples. Read it again with me. They are steered by a very small rudder. What's the, what's the next part say in your Bibles? Wherever who? The pilot wants. So I'm now asking myself a deeper question. It's not just, what's my tongue saying? The question is, Who's the pilot? Who's at the controls? Right? Because it is a small thing, really. Maritime, those of you who are into these larger vessels and stuff, right? You're at a fairly small control in relation to the rest of the vessel, and you're controlling a very small rudder at the back of the ship that really does direct the whole thing, but it is in the hands of someone. It is in the hands of someone. So what is it? What is it that determines what I say? What is it that controls this cognitive dissonance of I bless God in my hymns and I curse mankind in my judgment? I, I bless God in my amens and my scripture readings and, and I curse mankind in my criticisms and my better than thou. What's controlling that? We got to peek into... James chapter 4 to get our answer again. Very first verse in James chapter 4. Because I think James has a lot to say to be in agreement with the professor we read from earlier. Here's what he says is in control. He asks the question, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? The embattled mentality that somehow takes the reins and now begins to control what and when we say. Now, mind you, on the surface, we're saying it all in the name of religion. We're saying it all in the name of pure and, and the right thing to do. But dig deeper into the spirit of it and, and what's at the controls? Do you not realize it's from your desires that battle within you. You desire, but do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you can't get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. Right? That was what the professor was talking about, right? Increasingly shut out from society, so it leads to that embattled posture, this tense and suspicious posture, this quick to analyze and stipulate posture. What's causing the, the, the fight mode? Is it that stuff? 
Or is it this stuff? Something that's at battle within. Within. The embattled mentality says, we are not being given the level of control that we want, so we will grab at it any way we can. Huh? You desire, but you don't have, so you kill. You covet, but you can't get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. We have the truth. What do we do with the truth? How do we go with the truth? I'm going to close with a couple of things here because I'd like for us to consider some practical visions of what the people of God might consider in terms of the use of our tongue. James says, don't be quick to be teachers. In other words, don't be quick to stand on a pedestal over and against what everybody else knows or doesn't know. Oh, I'm here to teach you. This harkens in my mind back to a vision Isaiah had, Isaiah chapter 2. Isaiah chapter 2, Isaiah says, in the last days, in the last days, are we living in those last days, everybody? In the last days, here is what the invitation is going to sound like. The people of God are not going to be on a mountaintop saying to the rest of the world, let me teach you how to come to where I am. The people of God in the last days are going to be saying to everyone around them, come, let us go up the mountain of the Lord's house together. That's Isaiah 2. Different posture. Let us go up the mountain of the Lord's house together. Here's the next phrase. There we will learn his ways and we will walk in his path. Do you hear James? Don't be running after the teacher status. Change your posture a little bit and understand our mutual journey. Whatever experience you have in this life, whatever old or young you are in this life, whatever right or wrong you are in this life, we all are journeying together up the mountain. Come with me. How are my deeds and my words and my posture inviting people up the mountain of the Lord with me? Saying, hey, I don't know. Let's discover it together. Hey, here's something I've learned. Let's check in with God together on it. Let's go learn from him. We'll walk in his ways We'll learn his ways. We'll walk in his paths. Here's what this has to do with James in my mind. Remember what the other thing does, the embattled mentality? Does it lead us where we really want to go? It leads to, James talked about it, quarreling and fighting and tension and suspicion. And, but here's what Isaiah says about his vision. Those people, as they recognize their mutual opportunity to learn from God, they do something very special. Go home and read it again in Isaiah chapter 2. It's amazing. They will beat their swords into plowshares and beat their spears into pruning hooks. Did you hear how James ended the last part of this chapter? Peacemakers who sow in peace, agriculture here, reap a harvest of righteousness. That's the wisdom that comes from God. As we learn of him, we are growing in our relationship with each other. We recognize that we have a mutual opportunity to learn from God. And the things that used to cause quarreling and fighting are now turned around into cultivating, peacemaking, and the reaping of righteousness. I am ready to see those kind of last days. Yes, things are wasting away around us, but somehow among the people of God is this growth in a better perspective, growth in wisdom, not the wisdom that comes from the demons, because there is such a version. It comes with division. It comes with confusion. It comes with cognitive dissonance where we are okay blessing God and cursing them. That's the wisdom from the devil. 
according to James. But there is a wisdom among the people of God that is first and foremost pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. We're all on this journey together. Let's go learn from God. No, I'm not your teacher. You're not my teacher. I don't have the final word. You don't have the final word. Let's go up the mountain of the Lord's house together. How about it? Let's go learn his ways. Let's walk in his paths. Oh. Let me ask you. Are you feeling weary? Are you feeling heavy laden? Is society around you wearing you out? Is anybody in here frustrated? Do you feel outnumbered or outcast? Do you feel left behind or left out? We're all looking for a safe place, aren't we? And Jesus says, come to me and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. In other words, be my student. The yoke of the rabbi is what he's referring to here. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. You will find, you will find rest for your souls. You want to be in that vision from Isaiah versus this description of James where there's a double-mindedness of, man, it's a battle of, yeah, I'll bless God, but man, I'm going to slander those people around the dinner table. <clears throat> you want to be in a place of true soul rest? Jesus says, man, I've got the solution for you. We're told in the gospel according to Mark back in chapter 23, I talked about how the Pharisees loved to call themselves teacher and loved everybody else to call them teacher. Here's what Jesus says just a few verses later. Nobody is really a teacher except one, the Christ. Read it, Matthew 23. The only real teacher is the Messiah. So I've got to look with you at this again. Because if we compare what Jesus said to what James said, it's sobering, but it's true. What did James say? The teacher will be judged more strictly. Do you see him? He said, no one is a teacher except the one, the Messiah, took on the sins of the entire world on himself, judged more strictly in your place, in your, don't run for the role, the role has been taken for you, judged more strictly in your place and from the cross of Calvary rings the invitation, come to me, I will give you rest. Come to me, I have overcome the world. Come to me, I am your righteousness. Are we responding to the perceived oppressor or are we responding to the cross of Christ? If we respond to the place in society that we've given, that we've been assigned by them, that's an embattled mentality. But if we respond to the place in the kingdom that we've been assigned by him, I'm going to make up a word here, that's an unbattled mentality. Yeah. I typed that word in my sermon manuscript this week and I saw a nice red line in, in Microsoft Word. That's not a word. Well, now it is. Don't you like it? An unbattled mentality. Ah, a restful mentality. 
We've used our efforts to plow these swords into plowshares. Ah, and, on, and, and Isaiah says, and we will not study war anymore. An unbattled mentality. So I told you I liked his second example of the ship. Sometimes I watch documentaries about large vessels. It's just kind of a thing I do in my pastime sometimes. Right? I, I'm, I'm enthused by mega engineering and these kinds of things. And I notice that when the captain of a ship is taking that ship into specific harbors, there are just certain harbors in the world that have dangers to them. There's a shallow space here. There's a sandbar there. There are sharp rocks over there. And the protocol as you approach those harbors is the captain of the ship steps aside. And a local captain who knows the area comes in, takes the control, and guides that massive vessel safely home. I'm telling you folks, we're living in the last days. We are living, approaching the harbor. James reminds us that there are sandbars and sharp rocks, and, and if you allow your own embattled mentality to stay in control, you are going to run aground. We're all longing for home. We're all longing for that safe place. Who? is the pilot guiding the ship wherever he wants. Is it you? Or have you been willing to step aside and let the local pilot, the only one worthy to be called teacher, the one who knows the territory better than any of us do, are we allowing that person to step in, take control, and guide this ship safely home? Right, man, when that local captain steps onto a ship, every worker on that ship is now under the command of the local captain. The original captain has no say during that time. When the local guy says, go this way, he is in command. The other one is null and void. Where are you in your own ship? Where are you? The society around us is evoking an embattled mentality and it's, it, it's time for us. It's time for us. Here's the invitation. It's time for us to step aside and to say, take my life and let it be consecrated to you. Take my lips. Take my feet. Take my hands. Take my voice. Take my life. Guide me safely home. I can't do it. I try to control the rudder. It's no use. We're embattled. But in Christ, we have an invitation to be unbattled. In the world, you will have trouble. But take heart. I've overcome. Yeah, let, let me get the controls here. I, I know the way. I am the way. These things I have told you so that in yourself you may be embattled and zealous for the kingdom. No. These things I have told you so that in me you might have peace. Y'all, yeah, there's a rest available. There's a rest available. Captain, Christ, Messiah, today we find ourselves nearing home. We can see 
the splendor gleaming from the domes afar. We can see the glory streaming through the gates ajar. But between our current position and homeland is a treacherous sea. And Lord, it tempts us as we are dispersed among the nations to grab control and do our way into the harbor. I pray that you will help us to listen closely to James' example today. It's not just about the rudder. It's about a more important decision of who is the pilot at the controls of the rudder. Help us to choose the right captain, the one who is alone worthy to be teacher, the one who took our place to be judged more strictly than us, the one who invites us into his rest, into his peace. And so together our prayer is that you will take everything that we are under your control and guide this ship safely home. May all God's people say, Closing song number 330 should be on the screen. response of God to our prayer in song through the prophet the prophet Ezekiel I will take you out of the nations I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your own land I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols 
I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone, the embattled mentality, and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. May the God in whom we live and move and have our being guide us safely home. Amen.